On CNN Early Edition, will today's testimony make new ripples in the Whitewater controversy? The House is set to hear from regulators who say their investigation was blocked. Good morning from the CNN Newsroom. This is CNN Early Edition. I'm Bob Kane. Good morning. I'm Catherine Calloway, and today for Andrea Arsenault. And here are some of the stories just ahead on Early Edition. O.J. Simpson's attorneys are calling a new ruling the most important in the case so far. We'll have details in a live update from Los Angeles. In the line of fire, flames menace homes in Nevada and California. We'll have the latest on efforts to control the fires. And you could call it Elvis 101, a first ever college conference on the king of rock and roll. Our top story, the House Whitewater hearing, is expected to be told today that federal officials obstructed an investigation into the failure of an Arkansas savings and loan with ties to the Whitewater affair. In prepared testimony, Resolution Trust Company Corporation investigator Gene Lewis says, quote, this committee should know that I believe there was a concerted effort to obstruct, hamper, and manipulate the results of our investigation. A former federal home loan bank board examiner testified yesterday she found no evidence of any illegal activities on the part of President or Mrs. Clinton in her investigation of the savings and loan. And a confidential FBI memo obtained by CNN reflects the same view. The memo from the head of the Little Rock office to headquarters in Washington says, immediate, Little Rock will not initiate an investigation. United States attorney concurs there is absolutely no factual basis to suggest criminal activity by the Clintons and their Whitewater investment partner. The Senate Whitewater hearing yesterday looked into the handling of Whitewater-related documents after the suicide of Deputy White House Counsel Vince Foster. Former White House Communications Director David Gergen discussed White House re reaction rather to Vince Foster's suicide. And we were in unchar uncharted territory in the few, first few days afterwards, and I've often wondered whether, in fact, uh, the in the first few days, the people who were as close as they were to dealing with the papers and the documents and that sort of thing, uh, uh, whether they whether the grief did not, in fact, play a large role in how they were responding. Uh, you know, if, if, if you were going to sit down and write a rule book for the future, for how to handle suicides in the White House or the executive branch in the future or in a law firm or wherever it might be, you might want to suggest that those who are closest to it sort of in effect to recuse themselves and let others handle it because I think it's I think it's such a I think it was such a heavy burden on these people I think they did my judgment was in watching them and I was not close to those first few days my judgment was that they were doing the best they could CNN's live coverage of the Senate Whitewater hearings begins this morning at 9:30 a.m. Eastern Time an early casualty of the Whitewater affair begun serving his punishment Monday Webster Hubble entered a minimum security facility in Western Maryland yesterday. The former number three man at the Justice Department was sentenced to a 21-month prison term for mail fraud and tax evasion. Hubble was a close Clinton friend who was convicted of stealing nearly half a million dollars from clients while he was a lawyer at the Rose Law Firm in Little Rock, Arkansas. One of his clients was the Resolution Trust Corporation. It once investigated the failed Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan, which is now the focus of House hearings. At the O.J. Simpson murder trial, how a ruling by a North Carolina court might affect the case. Simpson's lawyers say they won an, an important decision, and with details on CNN, CNN's Mark Watts is in our Los Angeles Bureau. Good morning, Mark. Catherine, Bob, good morning. In what the defense is calling its biggest victory of the trial so far, a screenwriter has been ordered to turn over tapes which reportedly detail racial slurs from LAPD detective Mark Furman. CNN's Don Knapp has the story. While prosecutors and defense attorneys battled over the validity of DNA evidence here in Los Angeles, a court on the other side of the country handed the defense a tactical victory in its attempt to show police framed O.J. Simpson. The North Carolina Court of Appeals ordered a screenwriting instructor to turn over audio tapes of her interviews with Los Angeles police detective Mark Furman. On the tapes, Furman allegedly used numerous racial slurs or other racist words directed at African Americans. I think that the ruling in North Carolina today by the North Carolina Court of Appeals is probably the uh, key, uh, most important ruling in the case thus far. Defense attorneys contend Furman is a racist rogue cop who could have planted the bloody glove he found at Simpson's Rockingham home the morning after the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Lyle Goldman. Lee Bailey asked a very, very salient question. He said, Mr. Furman, are you as sure about not having used this word as you are about having found 
the alleged Rockingham glove. They tied it together. He says, absolutely, sir. That goes to the fundamental credibility of this individual. Early in the trial, Furman denied during testimony that he used the N-word during the past 10 years. Laura Hart McKinney said she interviewed Furman on various occasions from 1985 to 1994 regarding his experiences as a Los Angeles police officer. This uh, was a dialogue for a Hollywood script movie. This was 10 years ago, Mark Furman was collaborating with this lady on a, on a screenplay, uh, for a screenplay with a fictionalized version of uh, L.A. Cops. Furman's attorney says it's still not clear whether the jury will hear McKinney's testimony. Back in Los Angeles Superior Court, defense DNA expert witness John Gertis concluded his testimony, which was critical of LAPD crime lab techniques and PCR testing, but only after prosecutors got him to acknowledge that he found no fault with RFLP blood tests done by Cellmark Labs and the State Department of Justice. There's one item from Cellmark that's a reagent blank that shows some evidence of contamination. With that one exception, all of the rest appear clean. After Gertis concluded, UC Berkeley professor Terrence Speed took the stand to challenge the prosecution's DNA statistics. And it looks like the Nobel Prize winning inventor of the PCR process may testify for the defense. Dr. Mollick, you going to testify? Eventually, yeah. There was an empty chair in court Monday, the chair usually filled by Philadelphia Inquirer reporter Robin Clark. Judge Lance Ito told the jury of Clark's car accident death over the weekend. He was an excellent reporter. Uh, he was liked admired and most importantly respected by his colleagues and I think that's the highest tribute that anybody can pay in the journalism profession. So this evening we'll stand in recess in his memory. Don Knapp, CNN, Los Angeles. California's so-called checkbook journalism law inspired in part by the Simpson case has been ruled unconstitutional. The law forbids payments to prospective witnesses in criminal cases until the trial ends a federal judge yesterday said that violates the First Amendment. Several prospective Simpson witnesses have acknowledged receiving payments, including Jill Shively, who told the L.A. County Grand Jury that she saw Simpson driving his Ford Bronco near the home of Nicole Brown Simpson the night of the murders. She was paid $7,600 by two media outlets. She was later promptly dropped from the prosecution's witness list. Statistician Terrence Speed is scheduled to be back on the witness stand when testimony resumes this morning. And CNN's live coverage begins at the usual time, 12 noon Eastern, 9 in the morning Pacific. I'm Mark Watson, Los Angeles. Now back to Bob Kane in Atlanta for more of Early Edition.